We're beginning the new year with one of the most popular politicians in Canada. He was elected promising a very different kind of politics. But does the vision match the reality? I'm Mercedes Stevenson and the West Block begins now. Manitoba's NDP Premier campaigned on a platform to fix health care and address the affordability crisis. And he's on the bandwagon petitioning the Prime Minister for a break on the carbon tax. Can the Premier deliver on his promises? We check in with Wab Canoe. And with military brass warning the Canadian Armed Forces could struggle to defend Canada in an emergency, we get a reality check on the state of the military with a blockbuster panel of former military commanders. Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe was elected on a platform that was all about a fresh approach and change on Indigenous issues, the cost of living, and the big one, health care. First 100 days we are going to deliver immediate help to you and your family when it comes to affordability. And we are going to start the important work of uh, staffing up the health care system. Well, those 100 days are almost up and Canoe's critics say there isn't enough movement yet, especially on health care. Canu says that he inherited a financial situation and deficit that is far worse than what he was expecting. I spoke to the Premier recently about his new job and how he plans to deliver on what he promised. Premier Canu, welcome to the show. Uh, a great honour to have you on for your first interview. Well, the honour is all mine. Thanks for having me. You have been in power now for, uh, you know, about your first hundred-ish days in Manitoba. A chance to get um, a bit of a feel for the files, which always look different once you get into government than when you're outside. In your view, how have your first hundred days gone and, and what's the biggest challenge that you're facing? Well, it's been very positive so far, just in terms of the, the public response from people in the community. When I go to Home Depot or Walmart, people are feeling good about Manitoba. There's a lot of optimism in our province these days. And I think our team is really looking to do something with that. When we talk about the challenges, the challenge in healthcare continues to be one of the major uh, priorities that we have to address. We see, as with every winter, there's a, a really big impact on our hospitals and of course the impact of the pandemic, the impact of cuts under the previous government has uh, kind of exacerbated that situation. So one of the big things that we've been doing uh, in our first uh, 100 days in office is to set the stage for a long-term series of investments in healthcare, starting with the hospitals that have ICUs in our province, making sure that they have more staff, they have more capacity. And at the same time, we know that people are coming out of the holidays, those credit card statements are, are starting to arrive. And so on January 1st, we cut the provincial fuel tax on gasoline and diesel, just to give people uh, a bit of a break, because we know that along with healthcare, affordability is another major priority for Manitobans. I mean, two really interesting things there that you just said I want to follow up on. The first one, we'll, we'll go in reverse order here and start with what you said last. Uh, when you're talking about cutting the fuel tax, would you like to see the federal carbon tax exemption extended to Manitobans? I think that there's a, an argument uh, that Manitoba is maybe one of the strongest cases you could make that uh, the, the price on carbon should be revisited in our jurisdiction. And so, you know, that's something that I'd like to, to, to work on. And it's definitely something that I know Manitobans uh, would like to see some help with. We've put a lot of hard work in over the past five decades to build a low carbon electricity grid. We've paid the down payment on that mortgage. We're in a position to have a low carbon economy going forward into the future. And so I think our province has a really strong case to make that uh, during this time where we're, we're, we're dealing with inflation, we're dealing with the cost of living, that uh, we should get some consideration. We should get a little bit of help. And so our government, we're not looking to make any excuses or, or, or point the finger in different directions. We're taking action immediately with the provincial fuel tax. We're also in our budget to come this spring, going to put forward some, some good policy measures to chart a path towards net zero for our province that's going to use incentives and, and offering people help on the affordability front to make those changes. We got the heat pump program that we're working on with the federal government coming to our province. So I think there's a lot of good things to come that when you put it all together, 
we have a credible path to net zero, and as a result, I do think that uh, you know it's time that we take a look at that price on uh, carbon here in Manitoba. Yeah, I know you have a lot of farmers there, including uh, my wonderful uh, Aunt Phyllis and Uncle Philip, who are in Langrues, Manitoba, and uh, that carbon tax can be can be quite expensive for folks who live in in rural areas. I, I wanted to talk about the healthcare issue you raised because you made a lot of big promises on that, and then you discovered things were more difficult. Do you think you're going to be able to deliver realistically on the promises that you've made? We have to deliver on our commitment to fix healthcare, and. Even though we made a whole raft of specific announcements during the course of the campaign, the overall message is that step one has to be staffing. All the other stuff we want to do in healthcare, like new emergency rooms, a, a cancer care, state-of-the-art headquarters, we need staff if we want to be able to do those things, not to mention just to be able to meet the existing needs of Manitobans when it comes to surgeries or visits to the urgent care or ER, to do that in a more timely fashion. So the first steps that we're taking are to invest in the hospitals that have ICUs. These are some of the big workhorses for our provincial system, uh, a few of them here in Winnipeg, also Brandon, Selkirk. We're investing in the bed capacity there, which means the nurses, the staff to be able to take care of patients in those beds. This is hard work. It's requiring a careful touch. It's requiring new investment, but I think it's a necessary first step so that we can deliver on all the other priorities we have with healthcare as well. You have called for there to be a search of the landfill where the remains are believed to be of, of murdered indigenous women. And you'd called on the federal government to help with that as well and, and promised if you were elected that as premier you would contribute money to that search. Have you made any progress in your efforts to, to have these women found? We have made uh, some progress and I want to make clear that the steps we're taking are being done with the greatest of respect for the families. We're talking about family members uh, of people who were victims of some of the worst uh, crimes that we've seen in our province over the years. And uh, it's a real, real shame in my mind that this became a political issue during the campaign. I don't think that this ever should have been the fodder for political ads as we saw from the opposition. So instead, uh, we're taking the approach of these families deserve dignity, they deserve help in what I think everyone in the province wants to see, which is the administration of justice. And so as a result, the first step that we took after uh, the election was to apologize and to try to reset the relationship with the families. With that relationship and that line of communication now re-established, what we're doing on our end is we're working through the resourcing and the approach that will be necessary to do a landfill search in a way that's responsible with uh, our overall view towards the, the, the provincial finances here in Manitoba. And of course, there is an ongoing conversation with the federal government. We know that they've indicated they want to play a, a, a constructive and a, a collaborative, uh, proactive role on this. And of course, with First Nations leadership as well. You wrote to the Prime Minister offering to take people who are fleeing the violence and, and the bombings in Gaza to come to Manitoba. And of course, uh, as you recognize in that letter, it's, it's a federal decision, but you were volunteering your province. I'm wondering if you believe you have the capacity to accept refugees from Gaza, given the difficult housing situation and the homelessness that we see all across Canada, uh, but certainly in cities as well, like Winnipeg in your province. We have the capacity to help. And so the request that we've made to the Prime Minister and to the federal government is bring people from Gaza to Canada and we will accept some of these folks here in Manitoba. We've been working with folks in the Palestinian community, the Islamic community here in the province and I can tell you that there is a big appetite in those quarters to help with the support, with the housing, with the uh, cultural aspect of acclimatizing people here to uh, life in Manitoba, to deal with the path towards employment, a path towards education for these folks should they arrive. Of course, we want to be a, a cooperative and good partner with the federal government. There is a national security lens that needs to be put on these conversations. Uh, it is the federal government that would ultimately be bringing people into the country. But what we're saying is when you see people in a region like Gaza, when you see children, when you see parents who are being subject to the risk of starvation, I think no matter where you come from, all of our ancestors have con 
contended with the threat of starvation at some point in the past. And wouldn't you want someone to offer help in a situation like that? Of course, we know that the broader context of what's happening between Israel and Hamas, it does need to be stated clearly that uh, yes, we want to see a lasting ceasefire, but we also want to see the elimination of Hamas. And so we want to make clear that uh, we want to play a constructive role. We're working with partners in the Jewish community here in Manitoba, with partners in the Islamic and Palestinian communities. But on the issue of humanitarian assistance, we think that our country and our province can play a constructive role. And hopefully we do this in a way that doesn't facilitate long-term displacement, but actually allows for people to, to live in a good way and hopefully uh, return home in the future. Premier, thank you for your time and your thoughtful answers today. We look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you so much. Up next, we take a deep dive into the state of the Canadian military in 2024 with three retired high-ranking officers from the Navy, Air Force and the Army. Well, it's a new year, but some of the same old challenges for the Canadian Armed Forces. Just how dire is the state of the military and what would it take to repair it? I wanted to gather some retired military brass who I've known for a long time and who know these issues inside out. Joining us now is former Chief of the Defence Staff Tom Lawson and two former Vice Chiefs of the Defence Staff, Guy Thibault and Mark Norman. Uh, and of course, you're all from three different services too, because we had to have Air Force, Navy, Army. Before we get into those specifics, I wanted to ask you, as, as three former military leaders who are still very much involved in this world, how serious is the crisis that the Canadian Armed Forces is in? Tom? Well, I am by nature a very optimistic individual. It helps when you're in a military life that you're optimistic. To, to be really optimistic about the current situation, you've got to have a bit longer view because what we're seeing today, some of the problems that the chief and, and his entire leadership uh, cadre are dealing with are bigger and internal compared to what the three of us dealt with. Uh, the shortage of personnel, the rusting out of fleets, uh, and uh, uh, the shortage of spare parts, uh, really things that make it very tough today. And the, of course, on top of all that, the decrease in the budget that was just announced. Mark, I was really struck by what uh, General Ayer said and then what Admiral Topshi said. This is a level of candor I don't remember seeing since Rick Hillier is CDS, where there are things that are very public be, publicly being presented about, look, here are the expectations of what we're supposed to be able to do. Those are not so realistic anymore. It's getting harder and harder. And this is happening in an environment where there are growing calls for us to be involved internationally. You have Ukraine, you have Israel-Hamas conflict, you have China rising, and add on top of that all of these natural disasters. What impact does that have on the military's ability to meet the requirements that we have with the situation we're in? Yeah, I think that's a manifestation of what Tom just said, where this is unfortunately kind of a perfect storm of all of these challenges. Uh, overlapping in time and space with the mounting external challenges related to global security. And so the, the team that's trying to manage to lead their way through this, uh, everywhere they turn, they've got another, they got another roadblock obstacle uh, and, and challenge, whether it's not enough people and how they allocate that really scarce resource, um, the fleets not being available. The, the, the challenge is one of um, time, and you can't compress time. It's taken decades for these problems to really come home to roost the way that we're seeing them play out now, and there is no quick fix, um, even if there was an appetite and a will to try and fix it. What is the risk here for Canada? Well, it's a come-as-you-are world, so we have what we have to confront the challenges that the world is presenting us. And so, you know, the Canadian Army, for example, is in Latvia uh, leading a, a multinational brigade, and we have capabilities that are useful, but we don't have the full kind of capability suite to be able to match, I think, the expectations for Canada to fully uh, to meet our alliance uh, contributions. That's just one small example. So, of course, the Canadian Forces are an insurance policy uh, that are there for those emergencies that you can't foresee. And so not being ready is kind of the risk that we take by not being ready for that which is unforeseen. 
Uh, Tom, what did you make of, of hearing, as a former chief of the defense staff, of hearing a CDS be as blunt as Wayne Air has been? As a chief, I'm sure that uh, in, in uh, cooperation uh, with the ministers and those he would call his bosses, he's been giving, uh, given a little leash, uh, as has the head of the Navy and others. I think this is a good thing. I think good, clear talk at this time is a good thing. And I did say earlier that I'm optimistic. I, I think him sharing some of these short-term problems helps him deal with it. And, and when you actually look at some of the procurements that have gone through recently, uh, there is reason for optimism. There's been a lot of money that has been contracted for coming years. Those will be very heavy lifts to get all that new equipment in, but these are good things that show uh, some faith on behalf of the government for the future of the military. Mark, we had Admiral Topshi on the show. He, of course, is the Navy commander who put out this video that went viral with some reality checks, essentially, of, of here's what we're asked to do and here's what we may not be able to. And I was really struck that in the news recently with the Houthi rebels interfering with shipping, uh, Canada is not able to send a ship because we don't have one that can go. We're sending a, a handful of personnel. Give us a sense of what the state of the Navy is right now and, and how that impacts Canada from a defense and foreign policy perspective. Yeah, so, I mean, in the simplest terms possible, your two major uh, surface fleets are 30-ish um, on average, 30 years old. Um, they are fleets that are not easily supported. Um, they don't have the right level of spare parts people challenges, the technicians to fix them. So that affects the availability of the numbers on any given day. So you're probably looking at maybe on a good day, two thirds of that fleet is actually available to do something. And then when you look at the commitments, so the Navy just did a bit of a surge in the Western Pacific. Um, you can't turn those ships around uh, immediately and send them to the Middle East as much as um, there may be a legitimate need to do so. So, because you don't have the right people, the ships themselves uh, are t physically tired, and uh, you know, this is just, it's just a continuous vicious circle, <clears throat> and it's hard to break the momentum. And even new stuff is a long way away, and it eventually becomes old stuff, and that has to be factored into the long-term planning. Guy, I know that um the Army has been particularly hard hit by our support for Ukraine, and, and it's no question, the Ukrainians need it right now more than us. We're not fighting a war, but uh, we have three days, according to the CDS, of ammunition stocks if we were attacked. Um, I'm told that there is a real shortage of tanks because they are in Latvia and some have been given to Ukraine, uh, which is creating all kinds of additional problems. And just from a perspective of watching, I wonder if the Army is being treated as it's relevant anymore, because it seems like a lot of what used to be Army deployments are now Canadian special operations deployments because they can move more quickly and they have more people. Well, I think that uh, you know what the special forces have been doing in uh, northern Iraq was uh, properly adapted for their kind of skills and skill set. And I think what the Canadian Army is doing in Latvia is very appropriate for what the Army has trained to do and is equipped to do. And so, you know, in that sense, I think the uh, the employment is, is right. But I, I would say that much the same as what Admiral Warren just uh, described in terms of the readiness of our fleets. I think that in the, the case of the Canadian Army, uh, the maintenance of our extant fleets that we have uh, in support of our operational commitments uh, to just sustain that is very is very challenging and of course um, when everything is in the shop window we have to be able to prepare the the troops in the training and I think that's where you know the overall state of readiness of our material readiness and our personnel readiness is suffering by virtue of the employment of the Canadian forces we need to make sure they have the support in terms of the uh, the funds the operating funds the maintenance funds to be able to make sure Sure that we can actually sustain the fleets uh, for those operations and training. Well, and the, Ar home. the army in particular has been called on a lot for natural disasters, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, essentially, in a way, pinned down in Latvia now because there's such huge commitments there. Uh, Tom, the Air Force, you've been the lucky recipient of uh, some of the government's procurements lately. But I understand that there may be difficulty with having enough personnel to actually fly all of those new platforms. How's the Air Force doing? Well, uh, Mercedes, you'll remember I was Chief of Defense, so I felt like it was my Navy and my Army too. But for today, <laughs> I'm happy to speak about the Air Force that trained me. Uh, you're right. There are these $44, $46 billion of contracts uh, for over the next couple of decades. Uh, there's so much positive news there, but you bring up a really good point. 
who's going to do the heavy lift to bring these things in while we're trying to maintain the fleets that we've got going and carry out the missions domestically and internationally. It's been a big year for the Air Force. Uh, supporting Chinese Ukraine. air balloon exactly. got air a lot of attention to right. NORAD suddenly. Uh, a long range patrol uh, being bumped by uh, Chinese aircraft uh, and then all the search and rescue missions going on here at home. The Hell Air Nets out on, on board the ships. Big year. But uh, shortage of pilots, shortage of technicians to fix these things, uh, and, and that's going to keep them in the air. And it's a very tough problem. It goes to the problem that's been mentioned by, uh, by all three of us now, and that is with this great shortage, and you know, there's some indication from the Chief of Defence Staff that we're levelling out our numbers. Uh, unfortunately, the recruits are not uh, coming in at the rate they used to come in at. They're not converting at that rate. And although we're doing better than most in the G7, uh, this is a, a fundamental problem. How are how are we going to bring those people in for these? I think great careers toiling on the high ground. It's a very tough problem. Okay, super rapid fire round. I'm going to ask you guys what needs to be done, and and are we ready ready to to face off Mark against countries like China and Russia in the next ten years? Well, we're ready with what we have. Back to Guy's point, but what we have is inadequate in terms of quality and quantity. What we need. They're going to fix. There's too. There's too many problems to list. Let's fix the people problem, and support the challenges that have been described here by the three of us. Okay. I'd say the people problem is the centerpiece of all of this. In the end, we can have great equipment. We can have great processes. We can have great uh, kind of t uh, you know uh, policies. But in the end, we need the people to execute. And I think that's where we're really uh, short right now. Last word to you, Tom. I concur. I, I was always pleased with the state of the people and their skills. Uh, the equipment was well enough maintained that it could be employed very well. Uh, the shortage of the people has been mentioned by all three of us now is a really fundamental concern. Um, I'm really happy the chief and, and the head of the Navy, for instance, have been given the leash to talk about those things. We'll, we'll see uh, what surprises 2024 brings for the military. Maybe we'll finally see that defense policy review that I think we were expecting last spring to outline what the government would like the military to do. We'll find out. Thank you all three for joining us and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Thank Happy New Year. Up next, looking ahead to the 2024 U.S. presidential race, will it be a rematch of Trump versus Biden? Now for one last thing. 2024 has just begun, but the world is already anticipating November's U.S. presidential election. It's too early to officially declare it to be a rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, but the former Republican president is surging in the polls amongst GOP candidates ahead of next week's Iowa caucuses. While some dismiss Trump as an opportunistic and unfit politician, the reality is that whether you love him or hate him, he has an uncanny ability to capture the support of the frustrated and the disaffected. Joe Biden will have to run against his own record and find a way to appeal to Trump voters rather than simply alienating them, sometimes a difficult thing for the Democrats. Canada will have to deal with whoever the American people choose. And both Republicans and Democrats have favored Buy America policies, and both want to see us spending more on national defense. That's our show for today. We'll see you next Sunday.